Hi Year 12s, hopefully this will be about 10 minute screencast um, responding to the prompt. People tend to declare themselves in terms of what they saw, in terms of what they felt, in terms of what they remembered and in terms of their loyalties. Um, in class we talked about this a little bit so I'm not going to spend too much time on kind of um, unpacking the question as such but it's said by Harry kind of in the last third of the film and he's talking about um, the way in which people remember and what they remember and why they remember the th things the way they do. However, he does shortly after this um, remind uh, Sarah, who's interviewing him, that that doesn't mean that there are multiple truths, but that obviously these factors, what we see, what we feel, um, remember, and our loyalties affects the way we remember things. And so the question is, how is this true of stories we tell? So I've got about six ideas here, and I'm going to try and unpack them a little bit for you in this screencast. I'm not going to spend too much time on this first one because it's one I've written um, for my class, and that's kind of the topic sentence there. And it's really just focusing on the reaction of to Diane's pregnancy and the way that multiple um opinions exist on this and that ultimately reflects their relationship with Diane. That's why they see these different and seemingly conflicting reactions but um, they can all exist in harmony because they can all be true because of the different relationships which she has with these people. For example, you know, her brother Bob is a doctor. That might have been referenced or should have been referenced in there maybe. And he talks about the fact that she worried about Down syndrome. John um, thinks that she was excited because um, he was her son at the time. He's obviously late teens, I think. Um, might have been a little bit older at that time when he found out about um, Sarah. But he suggests that um, Diane's reaction was of excitement because she was looking for something new. And this is contrasted with... Um, Michael's version of events and also um, I haven't included in here but Harry said so something about she was thrilled so if you look up the um, word thrilled in the script you'll be able to find it alternatively you can look at different ways that people can see so this is about what people saw you could look at the way that the conservative Canadian society saw her and that's evidence in the newspaper and the court decision um, they and how the children saw their mother being treated by the media and I think really it focuses on the children's response to this as opposed to say Michael's or Harry's um, it's really John, Susie, Joanna and Mark but um, principally John, Susie and Joanna think that it was too harsh that's what they saw and they kind of feel sympathy for their mother because of that um, you can talk about um, what people saw was the performative aspect of Diane's character and therefore there is a consensus or a chorus about the kind of person that she was and you could look at um, the voiceovers, the music and the um, interview commentary that um, features from about 6 minutes 30 seconds uh, in the way in which Diane's characterised by all the different people and you can talk about how um, that suggests that people declare themselves in terms of what they saw. That is what they saw of Diane. Though ultimately in retrospect they find out that she was a woman of secrets and that, that suggests that they didn't see everything um, that she had on offer. She just showed them parts of her life. Um, you could compare the reactions to um, the fear that she was dying. So you've got Mort's reaction... Mort talks about it, um, I think, I, be I believe it's Anne Tate, it might be Deidre actually. Um, we've got Michael and John and he said everyone knew. Mort said she was scared like a bird, Michael said she had no real sense. So there's this contrasting views about whether she knew she was dying and the pregnancy one is um, talked about in here but you can see that from about the 20 minute mark in the film. A second paragraph idea is storyteller Harry Golkin argues that the recollections of others based on what they felt restricts one's ability to reach the truth because the same set of circumstances will affect people in different ways. He contends that there is no such thing as different truths but feels that there are many factors which impinge on our ability to accurately recall an event, time or moment and unless you are the principal party he does not believe that you're entitled to testify on that story or that memory and for what you'd say to be considered true. So, for example, he would suggest that what John and Michael have to say about his and Diane's relationship 
can't be considered um, the authority. It's only his testimony because he was the principal party to that. But as we know, um, Sarah Pauly is looking at much bigger or broader sense of Diane's life, not just her own conception and the relationship with Harry. She's um, looking at before and after that. Because she says, can you tell me about um, mum from the very beginning to the very end? And you might put something like that quote from the very beginning. Ultimately, ultimately though, he, as in Harry, is the least objective storyteller. Selfishly, he wants to focus on his and Diane's story only. He thinks that's what it should be about. And he claims that a love like theirs was utterly selfish. And it hints that, to me, that underscores his unreliability. And you can talk about he uses other phrases like this about the same time in the film. So just search that up in the script um, to talk about the way he felt about Diane. And, and to me, that suggests that he can't look at their relationship objectively. So he, therefore, isn't even a good, reliable re re um, narrator if you wanted a single kind of objective truth. And so I think to counteract that, um, what Polly does, she includes so many other stories because she doesn't think Harry or Michael or John or Susie or Joanna or um, Deidre or Anne, any of those singly can, um, can really reveal the full extent of the person Diane was. She needs all of them to do so. Um, and if you wanted to look at a particular case study or an example of it in the text, you might say Diane's infidelity in terms of the way people felt. This is what I'm focusing on in this paragraph. Felt and the reaction to that. Okay, so Diane's infidelity results in Mark refocusing on his marriage. He works harder to cement it. Michael's reaction is not one of judgment and it's, it is instead one of guilt at the man, mental anguish that Diane endures because of a secret she had to hide. He is sympathetic to the reality that she felt lonely, frustrated, unloved and unsatisfied. Um, and he's had time to kind of get to that point in his thinking, but he may very well have felt that at the time. But um, I think what I would be saying about this example is that um, Polly suggests that nobody um, is 100% reliable, but it's only if we get um, kind of excavate under these myths and pull out what people truly felt that we can in some way get to to the truth, okay? And that's what it is. So we can, um, Polly objects to Harry's narrow view of the truth and instead values all these feelings regardless of their impact on an accurate memory. So whether or not, because Michael now feels um, sympathy for Diane's mental anguish, whether that's made him have a more favourable memory of her um, or not, Sarah doesn't care about that. She just thinks that um, all of them are equally valued. And that's because she has a democratic um kind of theory for biographical autobiography okay and that means that everybody gets gets a voice all right polly believes that she can overcome the shortcomings that harry refers to by weaving together interviews narrative and home footage to give and giving equal weight to all testimony she embraces the discrepancies concluding that she can only ever get to an approximation of who Diane is based on what others saw, felt and remembered. So this is carrying on, it's building on that idea from before. Um, and it's basically, you're going to talk about how Polly does this. So Polly proves that memory is faulty by showing contradictions between stories. So you could talk about, mention any of those ones you talked about above, like the pregnancy in here or um, even her fear of dying or one of those examples, you can quickly reference that. And then what she also does is she includes the Super 8 footage, both genuine and faux, um, and challenges the audience to question what's true and what's not. So you could talk about the montage of images that happen in the first kind of 6 minutes 30. So it's hard to jump around on here was the most fun mm -hmm. I could think of as a child. She was infectious, enthusiastic, and excited about everything. My memory of mom is uh, of someone who was very loud. She walked very heavily. So this footage here, this is faux, but the footage just before was genuine. So the seamlessly like, kind of switching between those two makes us think initially that everything is um, true and correct, 
but um, and what people declare to have seen, Polly substantiates that by putting footage in to prove that that is what happened. But um, around the one hour, 30, 23 minute mark, sorry, we see that Sarah is actually the author of these scenes and that the and we then are left to wonder, well, what was real and what wasn't? And I think what that does is that's supposed to parallel this feeling that Polly has of not truly knowing um, what was true and what was not about Diane in terms of every single thing, but there are many things that are knowable. We've talked about that in Truth Questions. Um, and she concludes that the declarations of her storytellers, despite their inconsistencies, is the best way she can hope to capture um, Diane. And again, if you wanted to zone in on a specific example, John overhears the phone call at about the 29 minute mark about Diane commenting on the fact that um, she was unfaithful and that the father of her baby might not be Michael. And what's revealed is this the fact that John blocked this memory out and he stopped thinking about it. And this is about um, kind of this question of loyalties and the impact that has on our ability to tell the truth. He said, what good is it going to do? The family is a big enough mess. So um, it's just showing there basically that to overcome the shortcomings of the idea of people blocking out memories or stop thinking about it because they want to protect their family. That's their loyalty is what he's trying to do there. Um, Polly needs to have Harry contribute. She needs to have the other siblings have their say and Michael because she can only have a um, hope to reach any answer if she puts these all together and, and, and values them equally. And that's coming back to that democratic theory before. So we'll leave that dot point off. Another idea is stories we tell is Polly's exploration of the way in which we tell stories. She examines these stories in a therapy-like setting to find some consensus about who Diane Polly was as a person and what her relationship with Michael and Harry was like. So that would be focusing just on that relationship. And the film is framed around Michael's narrative, which is conveyed through the voiceover, because Michael knows a good portion of Diane's story, but it's not entirely his to tell, nor is his version of events entirely true, as evidenced in the interview layer. So, for example, he doesn't remember that Harry was at the funeral or, you know, what kind of parent Harry, Michael was. Etc. The interviews or talking heads convey how people feel, the points of consensus on what kind of she, um, person she was, but there are they are imperfect though in terms of the different um, messages about whether, whether she knew she was dying or not. Because I think the fact that Michael hasn't thinks that she has no real sense that she's dying is very different to what's said by these three other people, and that suggests maybe that. Um, Michael, it highlights the fact that Michael isn't necessarily a reliable narrator and, and his own, um, I don't know, sadness about it or what he saw of Diane made him think that she didn't know, which is an odd kind of um, predicament to find himself in. Despite these discrepancies, Polly does not intervene, but in giving each person equal weight suggests that each memory is equally valid. It is simply a reflection of their own memory. And the fact that Michael doesn't remember that she knew that these other three people do and that suggests overall that she did know and we get that sense that she did know. Um, maybe we feel sympathy for the fact that Michael didn't realise that she didn't know. Another idea, in the end we only really seem to catch glimpses of Diana's person, fragments from the testimonies of others that Polly attempts to weave together but in the end she only ever reached an approximation. So that's some of the ideas we've talked about above. This is underscored by the switching between genuine and faux home movie footage, which further destabilises any belief that we can ever get to an answer about who she was. As with Polly, the Polly family, the audience still wonder who was she as she continues slipping away from them at the end. Now that is not a topic sentence because it needs a bit of work, but some ideas. So you could say how authenticity is established through the home movies originally, as in it gives weight to the people's verbal testimonies because you've got the footage which um, plays underneath what people are saying and you can see that well you can hear them voicing it but this kind of authenticity is undercut when you get to that one hour 23 minute I think and it's revealed that Polly is actually directing those scenes and their actors and so we like the director lose sight of Diane and who she is and so um, whilst we declare ourselves um, and say what we know can or, or what they know about her you can't really ever get to um, a solid truth 
So the truth itself, Polly claimed, is ephemeral and hard to pin down. Despite this, Harry believed you can get very close to it through the declarations, these declarations. However, he challenges whether this is possible when there is such a chaos of voices of people who were not the principal parties to the event. He suggests that Polly is too indirect to accomplish this task and has to approximate the truth of what happened. You have to limit it to those directly involved. He desires a larger role in the narrative than the one he's given. In the end, it's Polly's interpretation of her mother's life based on the evidence that she unearthed in her interview. Um, but she's kind of self-reflexive and she wonders, have I lost my mind in trying to reconstruct the past from other people's words? And basically, like, is it even possible with all everything that people declare, which is clearly imperfect as we've already established above, people... Um, there are, it seems to me, not like Harry, there are multiple truths. I think that he's wrong to say that there's only one truth. I think that there are multiple truths and I think that's Polly's overall contention and I think that she can show that by showing all these different perspectives of people um, whose declarations depend on the relationship they had with Diane. And if they were her friend, her son, her daughter, her partner her romantic or significant other like what they see changes depending on who they are and I think by having all the different storytellers Polly's trying to say there are multiple existing truths and that's the the only way I can really truly kind of understand my mother or convey any sense of who she really was is to knit together all these different people all right 16 minutes I've gone over time I'll pause there any questions let me know this doc is linked below.